as I recall, to put a few chairs out in Garden Place many, many years ago when he had his first ice cream shop. And I'm sure some of you share, like me, the fond memories of the gelato. Oh, my children would eat gelato. I'd drink a coffee when we'd been to the library. And he was a wonderful character who got to know everyone. So today we just sadly remember him. And I will ask Martin to explain for us what, how we can pay our respects going forward. Yeah. Uh, thank you. The, we'll, you know, the, the correct tradition when a former elected member passes away, we'll obviously be observing our respects at the full council meeting, and that will give other councillors an opportunity, if they so wish, to, to say a few words at that uh, time. Uh, I think, Paula, you've summed it up in brief, those brief senses extremely well in terms of the great loss and the great contribution and great energy and character. So, uh, sorry, on Thursday is the full funeral, which is, those of you don't you know, it's at St Peter's Catholic Church in Cambridge. Uh, myself and I think Councillor McPherson will be going, because Councillor McPherson and I think along with Angela were the, the only two among us who were actually served with him as colleagues. Uh, and then on Thursday also, as a mark of our respect, the city will be formally flying its um, flag at half-mast. And then at the next full council, we will observe a greater time to honour uh, Joe's uh, contribution. And obviously, our thoughts, of course, all of us, uh, with his family. Um, and, and I think, if I can say, I think the funeral, while there's going to be a sense of sad loss, the funeral and our commentary should be an absolute celebration of the wonderful vitality uh, he lent to the city. So now we'll move on to uh, the, are there any apologies from the agenda? And I see that I have James uh, for absence and Dave for lateness. Is there anyone else? We'll no, do that, that at that's going to happen Andrew. at full council. Yeah. I've been, I understand that's the formal process. That's the process. Uh, Councillor Taylor, oh, Taylor, please. Anybody? Else? Apologies for anyone else. I no? assume Councillor McPherson for lateness. Is You've he... got that. Oh, Thank okay. you. Thank you. And now we'll uh, so move that those apologies be accepted, please. Ollie and Councillor Bunting. Thank you. Um, confirmation of the agenda, it is as it has been circulated. Um, I'll just talk about one item later on, which is the mural on, on the wall and how we might treat the public report and the in confidential, the PX report. But when we get close to that, we'll deal with that. Otherwise, it is as it is, uh, has been circulated. Please may I have someone move that the agenda be accepted. Councillor Henry. Councillor Tooman. Thank you. So, any, are there any declarations of interest on any of the matters appearing before us today? There being none, we'll move on. Thank you. Um, public forum. I understand we do have a couple of people in the public forum, Leanne. Thank you. I have uh, one, Madam Chair, that I'm aware of. Um, so, this morning, Deborah Fisher. If you'd like to come forward, Deborah. Deborah speaking to item eight, Playgrounds of the Future. Sorry, we've grown and we've moved around a bit. Um, Deborah, you'll have <coughs> three minutes to speak. Oh, a bell will go at two minutes and that'll let you know there's one minute remaining. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. The Playgrounds of Future document on today's agenda sets out which parks will have new place plans to develop with their current gaps in provision which specific existing playgrounds will receive an increased level of service and will guide the new and or upgraded provision in several areas. Staff consider the decision to approve this has low significance. As one of the submitters on the recent draft Neighbourhood and Amenity Reserves Management Plan and a commenter on the Hillcrest Park Survey, I would like to know at what point you will be taking the public submissions and comments made into account before deciding who gets what for the next 10 years. My submission on the draft neighbourhood and amenity reserves includes a request for an area in the East Ward that had been identified as a location that should have a playground developed during the 2007 neighbourhood and amenity management plan. The space was never addressed and 12 years on, its development has been dropped entirely, even though an additional 30 houses filled with young children and families have been added to the area. The closest playground is approximately one kilometre away. 
What is the point of the scheduled hearing on the 12th of March to discuss this and other issues that submitters have raised if you are to decide today without even considering the current community consultation being undertaken, what parks and playgrounds get priorities? We are told the Playgrounds of the Future has a strong connection to the play strategy. 2.83 Hamilton and play policy. The play in Hamilton policy has been developed to meet the following objective to ensure children and families have convenient access to safe and well-sourced resourced playgrounds. The policy recommends that Council provides a network of residential children's playgrounds located so that all residential residents' dwellings are within 500 metre radius of a playground and each playground contains at least a seat, swing of banks, bank of swings, bank of seesaws and a slide. Implementing the pay, play policy and the preparation of this management plan will ensure equitable spatial distribution of playgrounds on a citywide scale at local neighbourhood levels. Yet the playgrounds of the future still contains 12 gaps that do not currently have a playground resulting in the surrounding residents not being within 500 metres of a playground. Many have been waiting for years for a playground and eight of these gaps are in deprivation areas 8, 9 or 10. How is it equitable to upgrade or improve existing destination playgrounds while there are still areas that have been waiting for years for repairs, upgrades or just basic equipment? The current plan does not adequately ensure equitable spatial distribution throughout the city. Please revise the priorities after taking into account current and planned community consultation and a fair and equitable distribution of equipment and funding for all areas of the city. It is wrong to approve this while current community consultation is still being undertaken. Playgrounds of the Future has the potential to prevent or limit full consideration of many submissions or ideas on the Western Town Belt, the Sport and Recreation Strategy, the Neighbourhood and Amenity Reserves Management Plan and the Play Strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll see if there are um, a few questions. Thank you for taking the time to come in at short notice to, to um, share that, those thoughts. Uh, we've got, I've got a presenter too. Who's that? No, it's the oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I was a bit confused as to whether somebody didn't have their card pushed in hard enough. Uh, Councillor Mallett. Thanks, Deborah. Um, the playgrounds policy has a distance that most houses should be within reach of a, thing, a playground. Uh, do you think that's uh, too big, too small? I think expecting anybody with toddlers to walk for a kilometre to the closest closest playground is too much, yes. And there are areas that that is the case. A kilometre away with a toddler, you're expecting them to get in a car. People with toddlers should be able to walk to a playground. OK, so do you think it should be shorter than that? 500 metres is fine, but there are lots mm. of areas that aren't within 500 metres of a playground. There's at least 12. OK, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Malik. Um, Mayor King. minutes with Deborah before this paper comes up, um, especially on your first um, point you made about a specific playground. Just so that then um, staff can include that as part of what, when that paper comes up. That wasn't the only one that I mentioned in my submission. Yeah, Maria's there, so Deborah, yeah. if you want to talk to Maria Barry, she's just down the back yeah. there. So my, my intention was to put stakeholders, Maria is really um, quite happy to sit with you to step through what what the plans proposed do allow and what flexibility there are, is in outer years. But can I just question, the, the main point that you're leaving us with today is that in your view, local playgrounds should be local and there should be more emphasis in filling the gaps rather than yes. adding gloss to the already quite good playgrounds. Is that a fair y summary? Yes, that is, that is exactly it. There are areas that don't have stuff. And rather than upgrading or fixing or improving what we've already got, we need to concentrate on those that have nothing. Mm -hmm. And too many of them are in the low, low deprivation areas. Thank you. I understand you, you've uh, come to that conclusion from the map with the coloured dots yeah. where the playgrounds yeah. are. OK. Thank, thank you. Thank you for making that point. Thanks. Uh, I don't have any other questions. Are there, is there anyone else who would like from the public forum who would like to present... No? OK. Uh, just move that we've received... Do we have to move to receive the public forum? No, we won't. OK, we're moving on now for the confirmation of the agenda, item 5, on pages 7. From last time, are there any matters of, um, to be discussed? 
Any comments on the previous agenda? We've had chance. The minutes. Yeah, sorry, the minutes. Uh, being none, will somebody be happy to, to move those minutes be accepted? Councillor Hamilton. Okay, someone else who was a supporter. Thank you very much. Thank you. That moves us on to the next item. And just before this item comes up, because um, I just want to say a couple of words of, of what I'm trying to achieve in this committee for the rest of this year. Some, some committee chairs have a different way of working. I personally do believe that having items that are potentially just for information at one stage and then not far off for decision making are suitable here. And it gives us the opportunity to all hear from external presenters and all hear what each other feels or has concerns about that. So that's, you'll see there's two items that theoretically are not for decision making, but I prefer to bring them still to the forum because I think they're the important underbedding of information that we'll need for a decision later. So if you uh, disagree with me on that later, you can come and have a talk with me about that, about the process. So, so if you don't mind, just not to waste time, I, I invite you to come and talk to me about that afterwards, Gary. That would be good. So we're having some update, update ones on six, uh, item six, this one, and seven, which don't have specific actions attached to them. Okay. So we'll move on, and I'd like to welcome Matthew Cooper, Chief Executive, and Michelle. Michelle and Rebecca, Rebecca is... Rebecca, who I just met, so thank you. Sports for the Sports Waikato. Um, now, councillors, why I have invited them here is because they're making a lot of um, inroads into their strategy, their regional sports strategy, and what, uh, what the goals and actions are over the next 20 years. And I think we need to have a very firm understanding of those so that when we come to decision po points that relate to sporting and recreational activity, we're aligned. So that's why I've invited them. Thank you. Chair, Paula, uh, Mayor Andrew, councillors, um, staff, uh, on behalf of Michelle Hollins and Rebecca Thorby, thanks very much for the opportunity to present this morning. Um, just really is uh, quite, ex quite exciting. We get quite excited about numbers and uh, in terms of sport and recreation and play. And uh, we've got some pretty good data that we just want to show you. Uh, we see this as an opportunity for a, a, a chat, a conversation. Uh, there's a couple of slides here, but feel free to come in if you want to just have a chat to us through the presentation. Um, I, I think we've, we've gone against the grain a little bit in terms of our um, uh, historically Sport New Zealand's provided data uh, on a sort of a, a, a triennial sort of basis based on um, 500, uh, so surveying 500 adults across the region. Sport Waikato has never thought that was deep enough, so we've gone a bit deeper. We've gone to 500 adults across each district uh, across the Waikato region and 180 children from ages 5 to 17 to get some real understanding about what are their preferences towards sport, recreation and play. So we've dug a lot deeper at our cost, but we felt that we wanted to be a leader amongst uh, the rest of New Zealand, having 500 adults across Auckland, for example, is not really giving you sufficient enough data in terms of trying to get preferences of participation. So uh, we feel as though we're, pr we're pretty happy about that. Um, this relates to uh, moving Waikato 2025. That's a regional strategy. We partnered with yourselves, um, with, with education, with sport, with iwi. Uh, back in 2016. We're three years into it. It's a, it's a good strategy. It, it's working for us in terms of alignment to targeting participation, um, developing capability in clubs and sport, and then the regional leadership component, which is the likes of our facility work, our insight work, which uh, Rebecca Thorby leads for us. And just on facilities, um, can I acknowledge Council um, over the last month in terms of the performance 
of the likes of Seddon Park and FMG Stadium and, and in our own world, our awards at Claudin's Event Centre. Really neat, um, uh, if you're an audience or a fan, to be uh, involved uh, or having the opportunity to view and, and enjoy. Moving Waikato has, um, as I said, it's, it's, got, it's a 10 year plan. It's got three, um, three specific areas and we're hitting this in a horizon approach. And part of that is our insight work. Um, the Hamilton City play strategy really does align to this um, overarching regional strategy for sport and recreation and, and, and play. And, and I think that's the really important part, as you can see how we've upsized there um, in terms of our, uh, our numbers, which is that's Hamilton specific, and then also around what the preference is for them to participate. So Michelle and Rebecca will just take <coughs> you through what we've seen, and we'll compare Hamilton City. They'll be in blue in terms of our uh, the way that we highlight Hamilton City will be in blue compared to yellow, which is the regional data. So I'll pass over to Michelle. Um, so we, we recognise that you've had hopefully had the opportunity to read the profiles. They were sent to you in advance, but just as a highlight um, package, um, in terms of Hamilton adults, 58% of them do enough physical activity, 58% of the participants in the survey do enough physical activity positively influence their health. So that's five times a week, 30 minutes a day. Um, that is more than the um, regional number that came through, which was at 54%. Um, but 73% of Hamilton adults actually want to do more than they're currently doing, um, according to the numbers we got. So what you've got in front of you here is, in the blue, the top five places that Hamilton adults are active. Um, interestingly, on the right is the regional data. So we can see that walkways, public parks, um, gyms and fitness centres are all higher than the regional numbers. So um, more of a preference in the city to be out on the road, the walkway and in the playground and the park, and definitely more of a preference to be a member of a gym. Um, less so um, in the top five places to be active at home or in your own home. For um, young people in, this, in Hamilton City, we know 57% of Hamilton's young people that responded to the survey um, do enough to, to positively influence their health. So that's actually 420 minutes of physical activity a week. So it's a lot more than what we need um, our adults to do to be um, healthy and well. Um, this pretty much mirrors the regional data at 58%. Um, the young people in our region, as you can see there, Again, um, interested in um, playing at school, at home, but less likely to be active in the school grounds and at home than their regional um, counterparts. In terms of the top five activities for adults, you can see there the survey's pretty broad, so we do include gardening, or Sport New Zealand do include gardening. So interestingly, the, the um, preference in the, on the top left-hand corner for Hamilton adults are around doing something for yourself, so walking, individual workout, running, jogging, playing games, and being in the garden. Um, so top five, uh, top 10 sports um, mirror largely what's going on for adults across the region. Golf, tennis, football, table tennis, netball. So um, we're intrigued. I mean, rugby's not in there for adults. Um, and certainly um, to play those sports, tennis, tennis is a sport that membership numbers are actually going in the opposite direction to what this suggests, but the figures actually show you um, if you've played tennis, you don't have to be a member of a tennis club to have played tennis. So in the last seven days, this is um, the, the respondents said this is what they'd been doing. Do you want anything else? Um, in terms of young people, again, Hamilton is in the blue and the Waikato region are in yellow. So our young people, in terms of physical activity, have a preference for... Again, playing, playing games, playing in the playground, biking, running, jogging. So getting out um, and being active just in a sense of having fun. Um, for young people in Hamilton, football, um, soccer, futsal, number one sport recognises what they're doing. Um, athletics, track and field, netball, rugby, hockey, floorball, the top five. So um, again, some interesting sports filtering through to the top. Kapahaka is in number nine. Um, traditionally that may not have come through as a sport, organised sport at all, but it's certainly in the top ten for Hamilton City and the region's results. Um, in terms of why we participate, adults, 72% of them recognise that physical activity is important in their lives. 
89% recognise that um, being physically active is important for their health. So 72% said it is an important part of their lives, but 89% said it is a connection to their health. 60% of adults can't put their phone down. Interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, and why do we? Why are we physically active? Adults' response was really around losing weight, um, challenging themselves, improving skills, um, but will only do an activity if it's fun. 52% of the respondents said they'll only do if it's fun. So a, a su suggestion there that um, Hamilton's adults are very much participating in physical activity to um, have a positive outlook and do something fun, not necessarily around the competition side of things. In terms of our young people, 89% of them understand that physical activity is important for their health. Only 21% are um, connected to their phones permanently. This survey connects five to 17 year olds. So I think if we search the data a little bit more and we looked at 13 to 18 or 13 to seven year olds, that figure would be quite different. So, um, but certainly for kids, 62% of them are participating for fun. Um, so again, we get the strong theme of, of um, being with their friends, being out for fitness and health. The barriers when we say that um, both adults and kids want to do more, um, certainly time is the biggest factor that people are citing as the reason that they can't do it, um, and around being interested in doing other things. So what does that mean for us as providers and council as, um, as providers of infrastructure and partnership with us? Um, it's really about making things easy and accessible and, and taking things to where people are. Um, so certainly the connection back to the young people in the playgrounds and the schools and their local communities and for adults, enabling adults to be active where their kids are so they don't have to go to two different places to physically be active. Um, volunteering is an interesting statistic that we just wanted to show you. So 26% of adults um, noted who responded noted that they'd volunteered in the last um, 12 months and yet 45% of 12 to 17 year olds noted the same thing. So um, big question for us in partnership with the community is how do we keep these 12 to 17 year olds volunteering when they're older? Um, certainly shows 37% of adults may volunteer in the next 20, um, 12 months but 73% of the kids said they would. So. Um, we're struggling with volunteers in the sports sector, so this just highlights to us we need to celebrate our young volunteers and, and keep them engaged. Um, so really, questions and discussion with you, but certainly the, um, there's loads more information and data, and we can, we're here to support council in making its decisions, um, but definitely a connection with um, provision of infrastructure around roads, walkways and parks, enabling people to just be active spontaneously and in their own time, but um, an emphasis too on the need for the traditional sporting facilities. So we know with the facilities plan that um, Hamilton's a growing city and we do have some gaps in our provision, so keeping an our, our eye on those. Um, sport continues to hold a, an important place in the social connections in building um, a stronger community, um, but definitely the changing face of Hamilton and the Waikato region is going to challenge all of us around what is the right provision to be making. So happy to answer any questions, um, but certainly available um, for staff and councillors to understand more of the data at a later time if you want to. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for drawing that um, connection between what we need to do work on together, which that last slide is probably the most important part. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I'll take councillors' questions first. Councillor Bunting. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, just want to touch on futsal a little bit. Um, can you just um, elaborate on how quickly that's growing and do you predict, predict that to, to carry on? Or? Um, specifically futsal, have you got the thoughts on actual um, growth? I don't have actual growth for futsal, but football and futsal are growing significantly nationally yeah. um, and particularly in the Waikato region. The regional sports organisation, Waibot Football is quite strong and has a large membership. Secondary school data shows futsal is one of the top five um, growing. The <coughs> challenge will be for futsal is facilities. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was because it's an indoor sport. sport. It's an indoor sport, right? Yeah. So yeah. you can't, so um, outdoor football and futsal can't actually share facilities? No. So? so futsal, um, a international size football court runs crossways on the peak, but the schools will be playing on the netball courts, so they use the, the netball markings to play a futsal game. Right. 
Yes. So where's futsal getting played at the moment? It is being played at the peak, I know that. Um, I'm not sure where else in the city it's being played as okay. well. Hillcrest, yeah. Okay. Boys High, Fraser. Right. A yeah. Lot of, a lot of school so teams. So once they get out of school, are they, uh, are they, are they able to play futsal? Or? There is club futsal, which is being, being run by Waibot Football right. as well. So, yeah, cool. Yeah. And I'm certainly not leading you anywhere with this, um, but, um, and, uh, but if you had all the money in the world in a magic wand, um, in what order would you build facilities? <coughs> That's interesting, eh? I think I think that's a really hard question to answer. Um, but well, based on your your findings, anyway. Have a pot, have a ponder. You might need to come back yeah. to one that's that curly. So is that yeah. all right? If they yeah, have a, as long as I can get an answer. I'll, I'll book in yeah. a day yeah. to talk to you about that. Yeah, because <laughs> I, I mean, I guess the challenge for Hamilton is what we know is we're in need of aquatic space. Yeah. We're in need of um, indoor court space. We're in need of extra actual yeah. sporting playing fields, and then we've got challenges around the actual play component of what we do, so the safer playgrounds and, and roads and footpaths, but what order, I, yeah. So just one more I, if I might. Sorry, man. Oh, sorry. I, um, I, d I just wouldn't underestimate that some of those, when I, when I looked up there, and it's interesting, um, Councillor Dave's not here, and, and we know he's Mr Volleyball, and, and, and partly that might have been the last seven days, it might be a seasonal thing in terms of why that didn't feature. But I wouldn't underestimate the fact that when we talk facilities, we've also got to make sure we balance, and that's a part of our work, the quality of provision mm -hmm. of the delivery of that sport. Right. And if I think about football, particularly Waikato Bop football, I will commend them in terms of the way they run their sport. Mm -hmm. They are a very good organisation in terms of the way that they administer it, how many that they work with council on venue. Um, and that's, to me, a really important part. I think that we, there's, no point, there's no point council building bricks and mortar unless the actual the infrastructure and the quality is backed up to support your decision making. Okay. And just one last question. I know my ears perked up when you said we need more aquatic space. Can you, you, you that's, have you researched that or what's, what have you based that on? So the Regional Facilities Plan prioritises, um, I can't remember the exact square meterage, but additional space, indoor, indoor swimming space for Hamilton City. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, all year round. Okay. Yeah, really appreciate that. Yeah, thank, thank, you. You, thank you. And that is, of course, council is something that we will mm. have to face and talk more about, having more discussion about and some items today that have some relevance to that also. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, Councillor Bunting. Councillor Henry? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I've got a few questions. Um, did you divide it up between male and female? Because I, I know when, when you, with, um, and I don't want to generalise too much, but you talk to females and you mention exercise, they go into a nervous breakdown <laughs> slightly because they've got so many other things to do, um, especially mums um, with child, young children. So is there, did you make a distinction or the adults are just adults and we don't know exactly how many males or females you talk to? No, all the evidence shows that um, females participate less than their male counterparts. Yeah. Um, quite often what it shows is that while we might do as many days in a week, we certainly don't do the same amount of hours. Um, so we have launched a um, program ourselves called This Is Me, which actively targets girls' and women's participation. Um, yeah, so every piece of evidence you see, see shows that. Um, and okay. the, the rationale for us to launch in that space in our first horizon is that um, females guide a lot of the decision making in the household. Mm. That's um, right. <laughs> what I'd also add is, what I'd also add is that the barriers are very different mm. um, for women and girl and young girls, um, particularly time, family commitments, um, and feeling comfortable and safe in the the environment, so whether it's exercise, um, whether it's sporting context um, or recreation mm. context. Mm. Okay. Did you, did you um, include in that, I mean, there's a lot of incidents, incidental um, activities like walking the children around the lake and stuff like that. Is that included? Okay, it doesn't get your heart rate up, but it has got other benefits as well, doesn't it? Did you yes. include that as part of the exercise or not really? Does it have to bring... Because I read you half an hour of bring your heart rate up. Something that makes you puff, yes. which, which That's a can lot. be different for all of us, is the reality yeah. of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the data covers um, what we would term non-participants, so those that aren't physically active, raising their heart rate enough throughout a week. 
um, those that are almost there but not quite there and those that are meeting those guidelines so we can see the difference between those who are doing incidental exercise versus those that are actively getting out there and making an effort to be physically active. Okay. The other thing um, you talked, there was one of the, the second reason why people don't do exercise was um, they're too tired. Um, have you ever linked that to um, their um, dietary diets as well because um, you know eating too many carbs makes you really tired as well so is that part of your strategy as well of, of including some of uh, you know <laughs> nutrition part of our strategy has to be around the story of how physical acti activity actually makes you feel energized mm, and makes yeah. you feel good yeah. and with that comes hopefully the desire to eat well so that, that's part of the story that we are starting to talk about with the value of what sport and physical activity does for individuals and communities, yeah. Okay, okay. Oh, I just ha had one more thought, and uh, I think that that's really important for when we have transport discussions as well. And you talked about walking and cycling, and um, I, um, when I've been out and about, and I'm not worried about night time and so whatever. This is um, a question. Yeah, it is a question. There's more men out running and doing at night time, you know, uh, when it's dark. While women is, is more fearful, do, do you think with better lighting and everything, women would feel safer? Mm. Uh, the, the safety is a barrier, the, um, a, a big barrier for a lot of people. So, okay. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And one last question is, we have got all these stadia and we talked about we might need more. Um, is there any way we can use the cricket stadium and the rugby stadium for other things than, you know, that, you, that sport white cattle could use for other things than... <laughs> Mm. So it's I mean, more used? The cricket stadium's got some fairly precious grass in it, so I can't imagine us running too much on there, but the, yeah, yeah. Same with the rugby. Same with the rugby. Mm. So. Oh, precious yeah. grass. <laughs> right, precious grass. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Henry. Yeah. Um, next up, Counts, uh, Mark, Deputy just, Mayor. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Henry's questions, first of all, was the around the project energise and eating well. And I'm just trying to get a steer as to, you know, I, I think this is within the scope of your presentation. <coughs> at, at what, you know, what are your interactions with schools around those nutrition issues? Because obviously nutrition and exercise are, are interrelated and some schools might be partakers of Project Energise but sort of have about 10 or 20 sort of donuts and sugary fundraisers each year, one or two a year, cool. Um, you said, I'm just trying to get a balance because obviously the whole messaging from canteens and fundraisers, yeah. I think, are important. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Councillor Martin, um, all our schools are with Project Energise. Yeah. So, so all our schools are, are with Energise and they do have um, uh, strong guidelines and policies that relate to um, uh, healthier options as well as, as activity that our team will come in and work with them. So that message, I think, is um, after, I suppose, and you've been involved in this um, over 10 years now, um, you know, we're, we're, you know we, we believe that we're making some significant inroads into changing the, the habits of not only at the school, canteen, but also, um, also, also uh, bringing that message back home as well. So you think that that's obviously ongoing work? It's it, not it, 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 it dependent overnight. on us delivering on, on, on our contract with the DHB. Um, one thing that also came up at the DHB yes. Community Public Health Committee, and I, I think this presentation for that committee would be excellent personally, right. yeah. part of their population health but also here, is the issue of town planning mm. whereby um, over the years, if we go back 30 years, uh, all schools were unfenced, so that was often your nearest point of green space for spontaneous recreation. So the question recreation. is, please. Yes, no, this, I, yes. this is leading, I'm giving context. Yep. Uh, and also there was lower density. We now have high density population, a lot of flats on car parks, mm. um, and we also have a lot of schools now fenced off. So the opportunity for spontaneous recreation, mm. particularly for lower income kids, I So argue, those good points in debate, get to the uh, is, question, is, please. Is reduced, and I'm just wanting to ask you what work are you doing with the principals mm. and council um, to work out that our network of green spaces that are accessible uh, is is adequate and I just will give you a good example of yep. my intermediate
former Prince of I think of they've Germany. understood your question, yeah. so we'll get, we'll get an answer to the question, and I know that you'll have yeah. a chance to debate that. Okay, debate. I'm happy. I, just you. another word, you see what I mean? The point being of recreation is where where you live in a sm is the nearest accessible green space to kick mm. a ball around, and I'm arguing that it's declining. Potentially. Do you have a comment on that, on the shared use of um, yeah. education oh, resources? Well, locally? I think Rattatuna is a great example of a community that... Um, Council ourselves and the school have worked in partnership to open up the access um, for a community school partnership. Um, we continue to have conversations with other principals and other schools across the whole region around similar concepts, not just for built infrastructure, yeah. but how do we enable access um, to those as opposed to um, Councillor Henry, probably some of those other sporting facilities that are for specialist sports. Um, we do have a network of education land that. Um, could be used more appropriately. Okay, thank you. And just well, the follow-up question. I, you know, I'm not wanting to put you on the spot. How proactive are you with principals? Because if we look at that trend, you know, week by week, a piece of you know, kids are being denied weekend access to mm. those school grounds. Yep. Seems to be a whole trend. Yeah, councillor. You know, we um, we sit on we sit on the Waikato Secondary Schools Principals oh. Board. So we've got a we've got a seat on that, and we've also got a seat on the, the Waikato Primary Schools yeah. Intermediate Board. So Sport Waikato has influence inside those key boards on both primary, intermediate school, and secondary school across the region. Yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you very yeah. much. Thank you, thank you, Martin. Councillor Pascoe. Yeah, thanks. thanks, Rebecca, Michelle, and Matthew for presenting today and willingness to answer questions. My question is: um, Do you do you feel confident that? you have um, the willingness of our staff and the consultants that we employ from time to time um, coming to you at the right time, seeking your advice uh, on some of the major projects that we're doing around the city. The reason I ask that question is that later in this meeting, we're going to consider a, a very, very detailed report about Rotatuna, about the town centre and the related facilities, which is in public excluded at this stage. But when I look at the pre-engagement list of organisations who have been consulted, Sport Waikato is not one of those listed. So my question is, do you feel that you are being um, accessed and, con and asked for your views at the right time as we're moving along with these particular projects? It's um, probably never been better. It's probably never been better, Councillor, in terms of the, the dialogue we're having with staff around whether it's aquatics, whether it's um, facility planning, whether it's the play strategy with Amanda Banks. It's never been better. Okay, it's just, uh, uh, yep. it doesn't appear to be yep. showing in our reports, right. yep. that's all. Yep. Yep. But you're quite happy with what? Ab absolutely. With that, with that consultation. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pascoe. Mangai Tapura. Kia ora, good morning. Thank you for the report. Just a, a couple of questions. You um, mentioned that you've got seats on the secondary and yes. primary school board. So how does that correlate across to Kurukaupapa and the light schools? Is, is that they, they? Yeah. So our um, our role there is in terms of the the it's it's all related to our world of sport, recreation, play, or physical activity. So um, particularly the principals ones, we will come in there and, and speak to the primary and intermediate one. We have a specific sport and recreation principal secondary school group. Um, and they then uh, have consultation with all the schools across the region, So, which would include um, certainly... Um, and, 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 and also I would say that we are very fortunate to have an under five energised program, which is um, uh, just the, I suppose, the the younger version of Project Energised, which goes through all the early childhood centres and Kōrokopapa as well. So there is a strong relationship with Under 5 Energised, which really talks about fundamental skills and nutrition in that setting as well. So part of our, um, our, our organisation is structured that way. Excellent. The, and the report, is it able to be broken down into suburb level ethnicity areas of deprivation? The sample size is too small for us to go. Yeah. Um, we can certainly break it by um, ethnicity, age, age, deprivation. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, but um, we're gender. We, sometimes the yeah. information might become indicative because it's become too small. So yeah. we'd be leaning towards the regional data to give us some um, answers for small cool. areas. 
And so nutrition seems to be on everyone's mind. So, so my question around the nutrition is, is there an opportunity to include that in the next lot of surveys that go yeah. out? Because they kind of go hand in hand, as we've heard. So in the wider Active New Zealand survey, which these profiles are based off, there are some nutrition questions mm -hmm. um, regarding um, number of sugary drinks intake for adults, alcohol um, and smoking, lifestyle factors, um, and also number of fruit and Sleep vegetable well. servings. Yeah. Is that, sorry, is that from the, I know that's on the New Zealand Health Survey, that's on it's, the, it's in the and it's on the New Zealand survey, survey as yeah. well. Thank you. Yeah, we, I mean, we could do a nutrition profile out of the data that's there. Yeah. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Yeah. yeah. And, and so just lastly, what, because I note that there's been no change over the 10-year period for the, the region, but we're apparently doing really well in Hamilton City. What percentage is Hamilton City of the, that 54%? Of the 54% that are active, so the um, the the sample is just 500 for Hamilton, so it just the um, 5,000 sample shows the 54, and Hamilton is the 58, so proportionally it's more active. All the evidence shows that the city folk are more active than the rural rural folk, yeah. mm. and it could be um, for um, commuting purposes in. Um, closeness to actual mm. opportunities to participate yeah. as well. Yeah. Has, it, has it increased over time? Because I, 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 the reason that I'm asking is I think we're doing quite well and there may be learnings for other areas. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is the first time we've had this level of data. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I just think one, one good challenge for us going forward, and I've noticed now that Sport New Zealand and, um, and really the Ministry of Sport is in real strong uh, positive dialogue with education and health. And that's certainly part of the, this government and the word wellbeing is coming in strong. So I think it's really important for us and the likes of our, um, our uh, Hamilton City Council and our councils that we are looking positively at uh, potential, um, this whole wellbeing and what that might mean f for work here. Now we've just managed to secure a, uh, a pilot in North East Hamilton called Play Dot Sport. Now they're trying to get the best out of Project Energize and the best out of Play Dot Sport, which is really around um, lifting the game around uh, physical literacy and physical education in the school setting. We've targeted a coal up there of 20 schools, significant funding coming to Hamilton City, and that's funded by Sport New Zealand to really try and develop better um, education around physical activity, I suppose, um, in the school setting. So that's that's a new arrival, and that they want to replicate that across the nation, So, uh, which is really possible. Well done, thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Tooman. Yeah, a couple of questions is, I noticed there that 34% of these people who participate are involved in cycling. Mm. Um, my perception would be that the vast majority of these people would be off-road cycleways. Um, one concern which I've got, of course, is around the city here, we've got quite a few cycle lanes which are on road cycleways, or cycle lanes, I should say. How we actually get the motorist to actually show a bit of tolerance to the cyclist? You know, it's pretty frustrating. You're in a cycleway and uh, the local courier races past you, puts his brakes on and turns into the next business, you know, um, which is a little bit intimidating. Is there anything you could suggest that we could do, maybe an education-type campaign and this sort of stuff? I notice on the buses there they've got, let the bus go first, you know. Uh, the bus is going to do a hell of a lot more damage than is the cyclist, that's for sure. So I really don't know how we actually overcome this problem of, and, and look, not all cyclists are angels, there's no two ways about that, and not all motorists are angels, but do you think a campaign um, mainly targeted to motorists to give these cyclists a bit of a break? Yeah, it's a, you, you, you summed it up well, Councillor Team, and it's, it's both ways. I, I'm, I've sort of been watching that and observing it, and I'm, this is, I'm a bit big with me too, this whole thing about trying to um, uh, to, to make it easier, I mean, you, you know, do you do you make it diff do you make it more difficult for the cars inside the CBD? <laughs> do you make do you do you make it a bit more a difficult proposition for them? And, and then you allow, do you create some infrastructure which is a separation between the cyclist lane and, a, and a, I don't know how you do that with your infrastructure of having cars move around the city. You know, there's a, there's a few things here, and I look at how it evolved overseas over time, and 
Copenhagen started in 1920 when they started to, you know, so it doesn't happen overnight, but I know with Copenhagen they, uh, they certainly shifted it around that the cyclists became the number one mode of transport and uh, the vehicle's now number three. So um, is it a campaign? Um, are there channels within this, in the CBD that we make it more difficult for vehicles that allows more, more cycling opportunities? Challenging, I don't know, Michelle, have you got anything to add? Well, I think there's a, quite an integrated approach that will have to happen for safer cycling. You know, there's, there's driver education, there's cyclist education, there's communication. We need to look at the infrastructure. Um, you know, there, there's so many pieces to that puzzle. Um, for Maori, and we're involved in the National Bike Ready um, program, so looking at a regional um, delivery of that, which includes cycling education for younger people and adults, but also um, putting biking infrastructure into schools by the Bikes and Schools program. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's such a growing piece of um, the way people are active. And even more, we just watched someone bike past us this morning, a growing way of pe um, the way they're transporting themselves, but not necessarily being more active, a few electric bikes coming onto the scene. So we are gonna have to do something. We can't sit ignoring it. We, you know, we just have to have a think about what's the, the right pieces of the puzzle. Yeah, the, the, your, you know, your demonstration of your northern suburbs is fantastic, but that's new infrastructure, mm. and no, no, no doubt about it. But the white line is not going to be the... No. The white line's not the future in terms of separation between vehicle and car in our, in our growing city. Mm. OK, thank, thank you, everyone. Um, just one question um, left from me, which is around your comment around gaps and provision. So what are the, what are the next steps um, with us as infrastructure providers potentially to, um, to work through those gaps in provision? Um, so the, I mean, the sports facilities plan has the investigation into the university indoor court partnership in it. Um, it has the four additional fields, but at this stage are um, proposed into Rotatuna. The investigation into a partnership for an aquatics space. Um, but then I think it comes into some of the work, the great work that Amanda and, and the team have been doing around how do we balance the, the play aspects versus the organised sport component delivery mm. of. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, so then it becomes really important for us to pursue those, those three partnerships you've talked about and, um, and get a handle on Amanda's work with the play space and to actually implement that. Is that yeah. oh, and it, I mean, it's essential we keep the communication going to um, Councillor Pascoe's point before. Mm. Um, the more parties, the, the partnerships and funding, they're significant and they're really important for us oh. as a, a city to make some progress in this space. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you for coming in and answering those okay. questions. We appreciate it. The recommendation is only to... Um, hang on. I am forward to the next item. To receive the report... So is there somebody, somebody would be happy to move that we, oh. Councillor Bunting, Councillor Pascoe, all in favour? Oh, so would you like any discussion on it? Is there a discussion? Yes, there is. Uh, oh. Uh, Did that happen? That's the yellow That's version that you've got. So oh, okay, all right. And Thank the you. Blue are the Hamilton That's not city. the one we got. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. I uh, note, uh, as to Pora Wall and Dave, uh, that there was comprehensive discussion at the DHB around our, you know, population health team and regionally, you know, in terms of population health goals, recreation, and the incredible work you do and the partnership you have. And you know, with them, and also with with council, I would urge you to, as we should, keep the pressure on our primary school principals, uh, in the sense that I'll just use the example of Myra Intermediate former principal Darwin Bain worked out she had, they needed to fence the school, but they they fenced the buildings because of maintenance and security. Mm -hmm. But she worked out that the fields were the only bit of green space available, you know, within so many um, metres. Of a lot of houses, so they kept the, 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 the school fields open. And it just seems to me that with the high density, uh, increasing infill high density of Hamilton, council and yourselves yeah. need to work, and we need to work out, you know, what is, and there was a submission before around playgrounds, what is an acceptable walk distance for someone on foot? 
to get to a place where they can kick a ball around or run around. Now, in many cases, that may be just a council park. That's cool. But in some cases, the school will be the more logical place. And it just seems to me, I've seen this in other areas where th there might be a caretaker comes and works with council and yourselves, whatever. But it does, I think it worries me. If you look at in Melville area, you look at Frankton, you look at some of our higher density areas, I'm arguing that we need to have our eye on the ball in terms of people's available to do that spontaneous recreation. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mallett. Thank you. Thank you. report. It was great. Um, I just caution a little bit on the... Uh, that there is a lot of technology coming now that will be on cars, which will start to protect pedestrians and um, cyclists. I know for a fact that my car, which is a, you know, like it's six months old, um, it now will tell me if I'm going across a white line. That's lane departure, but that is also white line for a um, uh, for a um, cycle tra uh, cycle pathway. Um, and also, yeah, it, it not only warns me, it, it'll try and steer me off it. So. Uh, you know, I just caution that we don't, we, we, as in the council, probably not so much your responsibility, uh, that we need to be aware that there is technology only, inch, it's already in place, but it's not ubiquitous yet, it's not an every car, but over time it's really important that we take cognizance of this new, start, new technology and, and understand it before we start investing in old technology to protect people, because I think, you know, separation is... I think, from my understanding, the Nadia, that's, that's the way we want to get, is just, it, they, um, and, and that separation at the moment is done with cones or fences. In, in time, over time, that separation will be done di digitally, I'm pretty sure. So, and I don't think that's, you know, it might be a decade away, but it's certainly not a long, long, long way away. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Mallet, Councillor Henry. <clears throat> And thank you for the report. It actually was really interesting to read and um, finding out the fine print. It was just so small, finding out how many people, you know, I finally found it, how many thousand people or 100 people you, you checked out. And that was cool to see that. Look, um, I just, a couple of things I was thinking while, while the questions were going and, and um and, and looking at what, what you found with the young people and where they're heading, and, and rugby and cricket are not at the top of the sports anymore that they want to play. They've gone into so, because there's so, so much range now compared to 50 years ago. Um, so, we, and we spend a lot of money as a council on, on these big stadia. So I, I just, I just um, encourage you to maybe think of other ways how we can use the stadia and how we can... Um, well, save the precious grass, um, but still use the stadium a lot more because it does cost us a lot of more money. So this is just a challenge for you. The other challenges, uh, and I I'm, I'm should have asked and I'm not 100% sure, so I'm just guessing that you also get funded by the government. And... Um, Indirectly or directly, I'm not sure, but um, I would li like to see whether you could, um, because you talked about with, with the nutrition and the food and, and you're looking at that, and maybe you could lobby the government for, for um, doing a sugar tax at some stage in the future. That would be really cool. And maybe lobby um, 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 uh, uh, LTNZ? I oh, know, what is it called? Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, NZTA Transport Agency. Thank you, <laughs> not the IO. <laughs> um, to to um, have um, compulsory driving lessons because yes, our cars will get better, as Councillor Mallet said, and they will be more um, adaptable to what's happening on the roads. But there's still a lot of old cars on the roads, and uh, so maybe compulsory driver training. Uh, and, and like you said, cycling training is so important. I think for car drivers, it's the same. So just a challenge out for Sport Waikato to <laughs> maybe do something in that field. Thank you. We've got that. <laughs> Thank you. I think that means you had a very good debate there, Councillor Henry. <laughs> Councillor Bunting. But yeah, I'd just uh, like to respond to a couple of points raised. I personally would hate to see you um, lobby for driver education. I don't think um, that's a useful use of your funds. But however... Um, I'd be really interested in your next uh, work of um, seeing how much you can, an uh, you can integrate transport to and from events as a part of exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to a, a conference called Trappins quite recently, and they, they, they equated uh, the cycling industry, they call that the health industry, um, as opposed to the hospitals, which is the sickness industry, um, which is something that really rang true with quite a few councillors, and I think there's a real opportunity, perhaps, 
in exercise to and from organised events as well, the integration of that. Um, so I'd be really interested to see if, if you could tap into that with your next um, pieces, of, pieces of work. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, and and uh, just on that, Councillor, absolutely. I, I, I think that's. Uh, I mean, that's part of our role. I mean, I. I mean, we had the walking school buses. That was in terms yeah. of the kids, but in terms of the city, what a great city to actually move around and and yeah. get from A to B or get to a venue, a council venue. So, we're all set up. The, the template's brilliant, and we're just got to make sure now we uh, we now direct the people into that sort of way. So, absolutely. Okay. Thanks, so. The final, final comment before we move on to the next agenda. But it's first of all, I know that the team here, if any of the councillors want to go and sit with them and Absolutely. drill down into a particular area that, dri that they're driven to look into more, they'll be more, ha more than happy to arrange that, so please do. Um, can I say what I'm going to be um, looking for in the next year, year and a couple of years, especially as we may come towards a new long-term plan in a few years' time, is um, that area around um, gaps in provision and are we, because it's about outcomes to me, so is what we're doing collaboratively together, uh, the council through your, your regional sports strategy, um, is it delivering the outcomes? In other words, I would expect the um, gaps in provision to have shrunk, mm. the partnerships to have grown, um, as, amongst other things. So. Uh, of course, because I said on the trust for the peak with you, with you Michelle, I see how very well that um, that partnership structure is working to deliver a whole range of sport across the community. And that I think that's not even at its peak. The peak is not yet at its peak. It's getting there, though. So um, more of those um, so that we can all feel, I'm sure you want to, as much as we do, look at a, a report in three years' time and go, well, the trend has all been positive. So... Good luck. We'll work together. Thank you. Thank you, councillors. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. Sorry, Mayor King. Thank you, team, for what you do. Thank you for the partnership with Hamilton City. Um, thanks for trying to bring in our, the rest of the Waikato, the rest of the councils. Mm. I know that's um, difficult, and um, but just keep... We need to do this collaboratively, and I know that's the model you're trying to bring everybody together so you choose the best places for facilities and I just want to also acknowledge Dave McPherson one of our members here who's uh, strong strongly um, supports what you're doing where we're going and and the joint um, models that we're going ahead with with the peak and with the uni proposed yep. university which we've pledged money for so um, I just um, really think um, what you do and what you feed back into us is critical in our decision making. So, just thanks, Mayor Andrew, and, and just just on that, we, we're we're at a we're at a really good space now, I reckon, in terms of where we are at strategically, in terms of the information that we can provide, the work that you are doing. We're going to have to make some decisions. We're going to have to take a punt. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, no, sorry, we're getting into cross yeah. debate, and no, we should final comment, right. please, Matthew. Well, no, I'll just I'll just say thank you, but just just know, work with us. We're we're at a we're at a pretty new level now, so. Well, Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, and thank you for taking the time today. Thank you, councillors. Um, we are now on to the next item. We have Holly. We, oh, we moved and seconded it, didn't we? Did we? We haven't voted. It's been moved. It's been seconded. All in favour, say aye. aye. Any opposed? It's carried. Thank you. And now we are welcoming Holly to come and talk to us about the Community Waikato Insights into Community and Social Service Sector of Hamilton City Council, of the Hamilton City, I should say. Welcome. Thank you. I'm going really low tech today. I've just got my paper. Um, I wanted to keep it relatively short, so I'm sure we're not going to spend quite as much time as we did in that last round, although that was fascinating, so I'm pleased I got here early enough to hear it. I wanted to give a bit of an overview about what's been happening though in the community and social service sector, particularly in Hamilton City and the role of community Waikato, just let you know what it is that we're doing. Um, at the moment, we certainly are seeing a really effective and passionate um, sector. It's delivering um, s some quite um, a huge broad range of social service around the, the Hamilton City, including areas of community, disability, health, education, migrant um, and refugee services, volunteering, employment and community development. 
our role at Community Waikato is to support those organisations to do that. Uh, and we do that in, in three different ways. We uh, focused on building organisational capacity through providing a one-on-one -on -one advisory service where we meet individually with community organisations, we identify their needs and we walk them through a process to address any gaps that they have, particularly around risk management, funding, financial literacy, governance, leadership, those sorts of areas. We have a role as well to connect organisations around the region and we do that to create opportunities, um, partnerships, collaborations. We try to reduce duplication where we see issues of that, um, not quite as common as, as sometimes purported but um, there are some areas where there are some issues. Um, we also, we're also looking to increase sector knowledge um, of what's available in the city so that organisations can be sending um, their clients and um, people accessing their services to other services that would be of help. And finally, we're also involved in championing the sector and in that sense what we're trying to do is to promote the work that's under ha um, actually happening in the sector, speaking to submissions, letting local, regional and territorial authorities understand um, what's happening at a regional level but also we, we do that at government as well so they understand what is happening here in the Waikato region. Over the last year, uh, Community Waikato worked with 71 organisations based in Hamilton City. We've seen a growth of around 400 um, organisations in the last five years. And so when we're talking community organisations, it's actually breadth from sports, arts and community sector. But a growth in 400 um, in five years is quite high. And we think that that's got a lot to do with changes that were made um, in funding. So most organisations need to be a legal structure in order to access funding. So we're finding organisations that are operating even on needing three or four hundred dollars a year having to become a formal entity in order to be able to access that funding. We think that's a little bit of a... Um, not the most logical way to go because you end up with a whole lot of compliance obligation that, that community organisations are put under in order to be able to access very minimal funding. Um, we talk to the sector about what are some of the pinch points at the moment, what are, what are some of the recurring things that are going on. We're finding um, that there are food security continues to be a bit of a problem for the community. There are quite a number of organisations that are trying to address that locally. We've got Kai Evolution that has a great reach um, around Hamilton City, works through community houses as well to disseminate food throughout Hamilton. Um, we've got Free Store which opened in December is averaging around 200 people a day. Uh, we've got the Serve, so that provides a free meal um, every day, 365 days a year. They range um, having around 50 to 150 people at every sitting. Um, we've also got lunchtime community meals throughout the city that are often free or a gold coin donation. And of course the food banks alleviate some of that pressure. But the fact that we're seeing so much um, usage of those services is, um, uh, you know, raises some concern for us. Affordable accommodation, I'm sure this won't be news to you. It's also a bit of an issue for the community sector. There's been a high demand for accommodation that's accessible and affordable. I was talking to the YWCA recently. Um, they feel they had capacity to provide more housing, um, but they don't have the financial resource to build it. They've actually got the space, um, they've, they've got everything they, they, they could they could accommodate it if they had the financial resource to be able to build it. We also um, have concerns about sort of that housing crisis that's going on. So crisis housing, people being put into places like hotels and motels um, when they're unable to be housed by uh, Housing New Zealand. Then we have, of course, the pressure of local events such as the Sevens and people are shifted out of those spaces. Um, so clearly motels, hotels are not an emergency housing solution. Um, and we would like to see um, the community sector partner effectively with government and local territorial authorities to come up with some perhaps more um, practical solutions. We're also curious whether or not the Airbnb um, fad has had an impact on some long-term rental options for people and be quite keen to see some research in that. 
Um, housing discussion usually focuses on families, but we actually see a lot of um, people who are either without families or not in close contact with them. We've got a lot of um, new skilled migrants and students who come from overseas looking for places. We've got people who are leaving overcrowded situations and multi general families, um, and people moving closer to educational opportunities. So what we're really looking at is a mix of solutions um, across the city to accommodate all of that. Many of um, our community organisations are reporting having to manage quite complex mental health issues at the moment. So what they're finding is um, there's a suspicion that some people are leaving mental health services quite early and then are trying to access service in the community sector and the community sector is not necessarily skilled or trained enough to be able to manage um, the situations that are occurring in those spaces. And we know that statistically people with poor mental health are more vulnerable to crime and they also find it more difficult to secure long-term um, housing. At Community Waikato, we're experiencing a lot more requests for de-escalation training, which is training around um, how to manage a situation with an individual or individuals who are escalating in behaviour, and how to do that in a way um, that is non-confrontational, um, that keeps staff safe and, and that keeps um, the individual safe. So we think that that is a result um, of those difficulties that organisations are having trying to manage some of these uh, really complex issues in the community. Another area of concern raised by our community organisations has been the design of our communities, or more specifically, the sense that there might not be always a coordinated vision about what the city um, is meant to look like. So an example of, of this has been like the um, Jones Crescent, um, Beatty Street area where you've got two large arterial routes you know, on either side of the small community that is now crammed full of infill housing and there's like absolutely no green space and very little parking. So you've got cars everywhere, everything becomes a single lane, um, there aren't places for people to meet and greet and be a part of a community. Um, that was raised by not just um, organisations within that south end of the city, but concerns from people even over in the east as well that, that this infill is coming and we see infill as a solution for a number of the housing problems, but we'd like to, to see that that's done in a way that is um, sensitive to the needs of communities as well. In terms of what's coming in the future, um, charity services are undergoing a review of the Charity Services Act. They will be in Hamilton in March, um, March the 26th from memory. Uh, and Community Waikato will be supporting this by facilitating the consultation session and the feedback process on behalf of the Department of Internal Affairs. But could be a really good um, session for people to attend who have an interest in charities. Uh, a group of experts um, from around the country are getting together at the moment talking about governance. We find our most common service request at Community Waikato is around support for governance training. Um, our conversations with people providing capacity building services throughout the country is that governance is an issue in the NGO sector and particularly in small not-for-profit organisations. So we're working with organisations like Centre for Social Impact, Charity Services, Community Networks Aotearoa, um, Neighbourhood Support. Um, we're coming together to co-design a project to look at firstly raising um, the value of not-for-profit governance. We think it's, it's sort of seen as something you drag somebody into rather than um, understanding the um, obligations, the fiduciary duties that you have in that space, but also that it's, um, you, you know, it's, it's a, a role with value and that you're contributing something to an organisation. So we want to raise that profile and we also want to ensure that there is access to best practice um, with regards to governance, the tools, the resources, the skills and knowledge that people need in order to be effective in that role. In the last 10 years, we've seen a growth in the sector um, and the appetite for collaboration and partnerships, and we think that this is really heartening. Uh, Community Waikato has facilitated a number of collaborations around the region, and we're seeing interest and opportunities to co-locate uh, co in Hamilton City. Um, Community Waikato continue to engage in uh, conversations around this. Uh, we're looking to see how we can create opportunities for organisations to pull their resources, um, to, to share their knowledge, <laughs> um, uh, to share their costs as well, their overhead costs. 
So um, we also facilitate a number of networks around the region, including the Regional Transport Forum, um, the Managers Forum, and we support the Community House Network meetings as well. We do want to acknowledge the um, Community Development Unit and the work that they do around um, their uh, community network meetings as well. Um, I think they were struggling for a long time. When I say they, I mean community network meetings generally have struggled for a long time. And the two now provided by council uh, draw in a huge amount of people from right across the sector and I think that's been really effective at connecting, connecting individuals. Um, finally, Community Waikato will be hosting a sector-specific conference in November. Uh, we do this every two years. Uh, we do this for the community social service sector for um, Māori uh, organisations um, and marae. This year our theme is around storytelling, so how it is that we tell our stories, how it is that we express what it is we do and demonstrate the impact that we have in the sector. Uh, we'd encourage people from council to come along and attend those as well. It's a great opportunity to engage with a broad range of social services um, and providers and to hear what's actually happening at a grassroots level in our community. That's me. Thank you. And there was a lot in that. So, um if, if you like, you, we could circulate your notes for yeah, those. Sure. If, if, they're, if you're comfortable with that. If yeah. anybody would like those, let me know and we'll, we'll get them around so you can read and think about it. I've got a couple of questions later around what you said about the YWCA and houses and urban design, but I'll come back to that. I'll um, take the councillors first. Councillor Bunting. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Holly, uh, for that cool report and the energy you inject into the sector. I really appreciate that. It's fantastic. I just want to drill into the, uh, the food security issue you brought up mm. a little bit earlier on. When you say on a fixed income, can you define what your interpretation of a fixed income is? Because there are fixed incomes. Fixed yeah, income. yeah, absolutely. I, I'm talking about where people have... Um, Incomes where they're not meeting their, um, everything they need to survive. So it would be a living income, really. People who are, who are, who are on incomes below the living wage well, yeah. will struggle when they have any issues come up, like car problems or, you know. Um, and in fact, in some ways, those people are most at risk because they may not be so aware of the services that are available as well. Right, so you're suggesting a limited fixed income. Yeah, like, yes, okay, I am. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and in regards to that, and I really applaud Kai Bosch and, and everybody who's providing food and serve and the likes. Are we doing enough in your, in, in your mind to provide our own food with regards to gardening, community gardening, uh, the potential that lies there. I think the community gardening initiative is fantastic and we're seeing a lot of interest um, from communities and engaging in that and I think that there's some real benefits. Uh, local community houses have really got into the movement yeah. as well so I think that's brilliant. I think we could be doing more. I think um, particularly places where it looks like they can't do so much, say like the infill housing, there's a really great movement around planting in pots and being able to take your veggie garden with you so yeah. people who live in spaces where they are shifting. The, the problem is that the investment in gardening, the, the initial outlay can actually be relatively high, so that can be difficult for people. And also, there is certainly some skill. I know because I'm not very green-thumbed. I keep trying to grow stuff, and I don't necessarily grow up very well. Um, so, so I think sometimes we need to be a little bit aware of the cost sometimes of growing our own food, but I do think it could be a great solution, and particularly when it's facilitated through a, a community garden yeah, um, I guess I'd be interested to know if there's any um, outfits who support the likes of, you know, beautiful Avis Leeson, and she does so much in gardening education. Yeah. And I, do you know of any other outfits? I know Go Eco do a little bit. Yeah, Go Eco have um, done, uh, well, and, and what was um, um, environment, I want to say environment, why could on it wasn't that? You know, the, the previous oh, iteration yeah, yeah. Um, did a lot of work in that space as well. Permaculture Trust did a lot of work too in education. Yeah, um, Enviro Schools. Is yeah, Enviro yeah. Schools is doing very well, yeah. Yeah. Environment Centre, Go Eco. Thank yeah. you. That's me. Yeah. Thanks, Holly. Thank you, Councillor Bunting. Councillor O'Leary. Um, thanks, Holly, for your presentation. You mentioned um, that the 400 organisations are growing. You, you so a growth in 400 organisations from registered charities um, okay. from five years ago to today. So it's not an extra 400 from yeah. five years ago? Or yes, is it an is extra an extra 400. 400. So just on that, Holly, um, and in your view as CE of Community Waikato, what, do you think it, that it is an issue that there are so many organisations? And what's your, uh, what's your view on the missed opportunity of, of a lot of those who are delivering the same services actually coming together 
under one yeah. umbrella. I mean, oh, yeah, absolutely. Sometimes it's difficult because services are also effective when they're locally based. So you might have five services doing the same thing throughout the city, but their relationships are very localised, and that's important. You know, that's how people will access service. So I think that we need to be a little careful when we think about potential for duplication, that we don't actually want to cut communities off from being able to participate. I do think, though, that we do end up with a growth or a proliferation in, in community organisations when we have um, policies um, and laws like the Charities Act and, and like societies and trusts and, and the way that people access funding when um, an unintended consequence is the growth of community organisations, development of mores in, in order to be able to access minimal funding. And there are opportunities um, that funders can, can use to fund those organisations without them being a legal entity. It's a little bit different potentially for um, a council in that, um, you know, very public money. And so, you know, it's important to make sure that you can very much be accountable to money that goes out into community. But for other organisations providing funding, using umbrella organisations is a really effective way and a really good way to connect those organisations, potentially have them working together rather than independently. Mm. Mm. OK, thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Leary. Councillor uh, Mangai. Holly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Kia ora, Holly. Kia ora. Thanks for your report. Uh, further to Councillor O'Leary's question, my two questions are around how uh, well is that community sector energy being aligned, particularly around the five pinch areas and mindful 400 new organisations. So is there a, how is the alignment happening? Is it happening? Yeah, it is. I think the, the network meetings, the managers forums, um, you know, the conference provides spaces for people to come together and talk about some of those issues. We at times facilitate meetings for uh, the sector when we're asked, so we'll bring different groups together and talk across those points. Um, we also have um, a number of other forums where we meet with um, CEOs across the sector to talk about some of those high level strategic issues and think about how it is we can work together to affect change. So we're involved in a strategic planners sort of network like with the WinTech and um, Sport Waikato, for example, Community Living, you know, a number of organisations like that to, to look at where those opportunities are to connect together and where those issues connect together, because often those issues aren't in isolation. People suffering issues around food and security often having some sort of problems around their housing as well. So, yeah, those certainly there are conversations happening. I don't think we're doing as much as we could, and I think part of the problem is that organisations become so overburdened with their day-to-day -day work that being able to step back and do the strategy becomes quite difficult. So there's no actual formal framework that sits over top of that? No, there isn't. So, uh, are you seeing, um, you know, we're seeing uh, social economic deprivation um, spread and grow across the city. Are you seeing any really effective local level collaborations in those areas of high social economic deprivation? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I suppose it's difficult because what we do as a sector is essentially band-aid work, and that's all it ever is. Um, in order to be able to affect long-term systemic um, issues, that has to be done at a policy level. So the work that we do is quite reactive to what's happening in community organisations, and we find that that is effective in terms of the outcomes being reported by community organisations. But that impacts individual lives. So in terms of, of making change in whole communities, I think we don't see the type of change that we would like to see and we think if we partnered better with territorial authorities and government, we would be able to work better to affect greater change. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mallet. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. Hey, you mentioned, and Angela brought it up too, the uh, Charity Services Act, mm. a, a review. What are, the, what are the issues in regards to reviewing that act? Uh, there, there are a number of them that they're looking at. Um, they intend to retain the act, so it's not that they're going to get rid of it completely. Um, they are looking at the impact it has on some of those smaller organisations, and they're looking at some specifics around... Issues, for example, like advocacy, um, which was identified, for example, as a non-charitable activity, and whether or not um, that needs to be reviewed, and the, the intention is they think it does, that they see it as a, the sort of advocacy that happens at a community level is charitable, and it's different from, say, political advocacy. So, so there are those sorts of things um, being 
been looked at. Um, I am writing a report this afternoon that should give a synopsis of that, and I can send that through to you as well if you'd find that helpful, what some of those key, key changes are. Okay. So one of the things that may be involved in this, and I don't know, is it taxable status? Um, no, not at this point. That's my understanding is that's not been looked at at this in this review. But I'll double check that. So they are all. Te if, if if you are a, and I don't know the right term. If you are a charitable server. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah you are that, tax not taxable on your profits. That's right. Like that. That's right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mallet. Councillor Henry. Chair, and thank you so much, Holly. Uh, uh, you brought so much energy into this room. It's amazing. <laughs> Fabulous. Look. Um, you were talking about uh, deprivation and especially in, in, the, in, uh, in emergency housing and affordable housing. And, um, and overseas, there have been some really successful models of, of cities actually buying into that. Do you feel that Hammond City Council needs to, well, with the help of government, needs to really put more skin in the game to, to, um, to provide um, social housing, affordable housing, yeah. emergency housing? I'm, I'm sure it won't be a surprise to anyone here that, that you know, I'm a supporter of local territorial authorities providing um, social housing, and I did submit during that process as well when council made a decision. Um, <clears throat> and I, I do see some real value in council having skin in that game. I also see value in the community sector having skin in the game too, but I also see it probably being primarily led at a government level. Um, yeah, I think that, that we actually need a lot more thought through solutions, a lot more complex solutions. I don't think a one size fits all approach is actually going to accommodate needs um, for, the, for the sector, um, for our community generally, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. The other question I just have with, with talking about food and, you know, uh, um, about um, the um, um, community gardens and everything, which is fantastic. There's also a lot of people out there that have got fruit trees in there oh, in their absolutely. backyards, and it just falls to the ground. I mean, I'm so aware of that, looking at it all. Is there some way that um, community Waikato could um, that, that's not tap us, into that? But or? We, do, we do have organisations that do that. Um, cool. There's, you know, fruit trees, um, Hamilton organisation that, that does okay. that sort of stuff. Even in my local neighbourhood, when I walk around the block, um, we had a neighbour with a massive plum tree that just had a box out on the side of the road saying free, so I'd just go p and pick up plums every day walking around. And I'd like to see more initiatives like okay. that yeah. happen. We've also got some of those um, uh, sort of kai boxes outside our houses where people donate food, just put it in there and others take it away. And that was, that's been happening effectively throughout the country, but we've seen some examples of it in Hamilton too. I do agree. I'd, there, there are some areas around Hamilton too that have um, trees available to the public, so those of us in the know know where to go to get our walnuts. Um, <laughs> there are a couple of, of other like lemon trees and things like that. I would like to see more of that planted around the city. So you would like us to plant more fruit trees? Yeah, I think that'd be great. Awesome. Um, when, I was at the, <laughs> when I was at the community <laughs> house, um, one of the things I did just before I left was plant several fruit trees around the outside of the community house to give community access to food. I made two mistakes. <laughs> one was planting an apple tree and the other was planting a fig tree really close to the house. <laughs> I didn't realise quite how big that gets, so <laughs> they now look ginormous, but it's great. They are providing food for the community. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes. Mayor King. Uh, you talked about feeding the struggling and hungry, and uh, you listed a list of mm. people that did that. Could you make that up? and distribute it to elected members for yeah. um, distribution that would help us Absolutely. Um, win. I'd, I'd like to make a point too that, that certainly the, the core of what they're doing is, is feeding people who are hungry, but they also actually create relationships and networks between some of those people in our community, and that's really effective. People often go to places like the Serve because they sit in, with a group of people and have conversations and people feel lonely. So, you know, that's the other part of what it is that these organisations are offering when they're offering these sort of basic services. But yes, I will, I will get for you a, a list of what's available around the city. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. And just on your letterhead and um, even a comment on, on the companionship that you referred to. Sure. Just, um, I think that's an important part of... I think you've identified another area apart from hunger there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a one question I want to pick up you, uh, around your bullet points um, around affordable housing and the ongoing urban design of our communities. 
I dare say we can't really cover this off today with all my talking, <laughs> so I'll come and see you. But um, was really my ears pricked up when uh, my first question before you spoke to us that I'd written last night was, what do you see as the key solution to housing and urban design? But that's a very broad question, mm. so to put you on the spot. But if you've got a couple of key take-homes, take -homes, I'd like to hear it. And then um, my ears pricked up with the YMCA comment. Mm. What, so they've got land, which is often the most expensive part of, a de of um, yeah. the development. Um, they've got the willingness, the capacity in terms of resources. But, but not that, the money to but build. But not the actual money mm. to build. So, so where do you go in a situation like that? What do you think... Well, I mean, this is where I think there are opportunities for partnership, and I think that could include partners like Council, but also partners like Habitat for Humanity. You know, um, there, there are a number of partners, I think, that could come to the table for something like that. Um, and I will be having another conversation with them about that and, and what it is that might be possible for them. Hmm. Um, in terms of what are the solutions for our communities, I think keeping in mind that um, if we want communities to... Um, to come together, to have relationships, to be able to pick up plums from, you know, free boxes when you're walking around. You do need to be able to accommodate people getting out there and walking out there, being in spaces like green spaces, you know, having a sense of community. So when new developments are coming up, or actually it's not so much the new developments, I think they're often quite well thought through. It's when we start working on older communities and putting more houses in there because the change, of course, you know, um, of type of housing in that area might suddenly allow for greater intensification. Thinking through the consequences of that if it isn't sort of balanced with a need for communities to be able to connect. Yes, OK, thank you. Let's talk more about that, but thank you very much. Um, so this is also for uh, to receive the report, so if somebody would admit Councillor Henry, Mangai Oli... Uh, all in favour? Oh, you want to speak to it? Any okay. debate? Sorry. Carry Very quickly, uh, this, I'll this speak quick. previous report, this report is excellent, and this is a good example of what a real community development committee does in terms of hearing from our community. Your point about the social housing uh, is noted, and as you well know, some of us, you know, it is history, but some of us strongly oppose, we talk about voting records, some of us strongly oppose that, but under this mayor and this council with the $2 million you know, social housing fund, and Dave and, is, and Rob are involved in that, and I think very much wanting to interact with mm. you. But I certainly strongly, through the chair, encourage uh, you know, regular reports like this just to give us a, a state of the city and state of the region. Thank you. been really useful. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Is there other discussion? I was just a bit quick there. No more discussion? All those in favour say aye. Opposed? There is no opposition. Thank you, councillors. Um, I'm suggesting we take it... I know the playgrounds will take a little bit of what, a while and then the next two definitely will. So I'm suggesting we take a um, till quarter past for comfort and drink. Bring yourself some food, please.